This is American History TV's Lectures in History podcast. This week, a class on some of the issues debated during the Constitutional Convention of 1787, including arguments by James Madison. It's taught by Stanford University professor Jay Rakove. This episode was recorded in 2015. Uh, and the, the general title for the lecture is Three Myths About the Convention, and I'll explain as we go along um, exactly what those myths are. Um, let, me start, let me start, though, just by picking up where we left off on Wednesday. So the main argument I was trying to make then uh, pivots on Madison's, James Madison's role uh, as the agenda maker for the Philadelphia Convention. And the particular argument I wanted to make that as Madison prepares himself for the convention in the weeks uh, just, just before it's due to meet in mid-May 1787, I think the key item um, that he works out on his agenda is the idea that a system of federalism based upon the voluntary compliance of the states with the recommendations, the resolutions, the requisitions that came from the Continental Congress was never going to work. And when he reasons about this, he does so in a very interesting way. He combines a set of empirical observations uh, about what had, what had taken place back in the mid-1770s and the lessons that Americans, Americans like him, uh, had learned since 1776 by watching how the system functioned. And then he takes a step back. And when he takes a step back, what he really does is to think abstractly in what we can see is, at least implicitly, a game theoretic framework uh, where he comes up with the idea that because states have different interests and because different interests within each state will always have some incentive to as I said, run against Washington, to run against national directives, national policies. And also because even where states have a common interest, if you're mistrustful about what other states are going to do, you're going to have this repetitive net drag on the federal system. So the federal system is never going to function efficiently. Uh, under such a system, as it says, this will never fail to render federal measures abortive. And so from that position, he reaches the conclusion that what needs to be done is you need to have a system that is going to operate by law, not by recommendations. And if it operates by law, you therefore have to create a national government that looks like a regular government in the full sense of the term, meaning it has to have an independent legislature, it has to have an independent executive, it has to have an independent judiciary. Once you reach that point, then you're in a position to start drawing lessons from uh, all the experience that Americans have been accumulating over the past decade. And Madison, among others, had accumulated a lot of those lessons because he had been highly active in both national and state politics. And indeed, many of the insights that I think he brought to the Constitution-Making Project in 1787 come out of lessons he was drawing uh, in Medias Race in the process of being a member both of, well, of two delivery bodies, the Continental Congress in Philadelphia, and then later Princeton, uh, and then also um, uh, the Virginia General Assembly. Uh, which starts to meet in Richmond uh, in the middle of the 1780s. There's one other point we didn't get to, which I just mentioned in passing. At the very end of that essay on the vices of the political system of the United States, Madison launches into a wholly new topic. He has three items, uh, which he lists as uh, the multiplicity, the mutability, and finally, the injustice of state legislation. Uh, and when it gets to the injustice question, he has a wonderful passage in which he says, uh, uh, it's the effect that... Uh, uh, you know, multiplicity and immutability, though bad enough in, in themselves, are secondary to a deeper question, uh, which is the idea that legislatures ruling in the states are ruling unjustly. And he says, this calls into question the fundamental premise of Republican government, that the majority who rule in such governments are the safest guardians both of public good and of private rights. That the majorities who rule in such governments are the safest guardians both of public good in our private rights. In other words, Madison's reached the position in the spring of 1787 where he's really starting to question the fundamental premises of majority, majoritarian rule, or he's looking for ways to deal with what he sees as the vices, to use the language of the Federalist 10, the vices of a factious majority, uh, the vices of a majority which is not, which is not going to be respectful either of the public good, what is the true public interest on the one hand, or of private rights. And this is the point where he first works out the analysis that many of us know better from Federalist 10, because he says, well, there are different sources of these vices. And some line the legislatures, and he talks a little bit, but in a fairly compressed way, about you know, the, what's wrong with state legislatures. But he says, the real, but the you know, more frequent, if not more fatal source of faction lies in the people themselves. And that's the point where he starts talking about the way in which if we're going to build a republic, we can't assume that we're going to have a collection of virtuous citizens who will always subordinate 
uh, private uh, interest of public good, we have to assume that people act on the basis of opinion, passion, and, and self-interest. And if that's the case, we need to think about a way to improve the quality of our deliberations. So I raise this point uh, because it seems to me to, to kind of go back to the outline and start with the outline for today. I think it's critical to, critical to figure out um, what is the significance of Madison having worked out this agenda. Uh, so I thought about this. I, ca I can't resist putting this slide up. Uh, this is a kind of, my, you know, so I have first-hand knowledge of Madison. Uh, I always like the way in which my leather jacket goes, you know, with the statue. So this is up in the National Constitution Center. This photo was taken actually when I, I taught at Stanford, Washington, back in the, the spring of 2008. A student snapped it for me, and I've, I've been using it ever since. Uh, it appears in my, you know, my own little personal site at my 50th high school reunion, <laughs> you know, from, from last fall. Uh, so I'll, I'll speak some, as I like to, I'll speak some authoritatively from Madison. This, of course, is Independence Hall, the Pennsylvania State House. So, what difference does an agenda make? I think it's really important for us to understand at the outset that it was not said ab initio from the beginning exactly what the convention was going to do. There, there wasn't much circulation of ideas. There was a little bit. There wasn't much circulation about ideas as to what the real agenda for Philadelphia was going to be. Uh, Madison's had worked out, and Henry Knox, who was the Secretary of War, had sent a plan of his own off to George Washington. There's a little circle of kind of army officers uh, who have their own notion of what might be done. But there's not extensive public discussion about exactly what it is uh, the convention was going to do. And we can imagine thinking, you know, retrospectively, or situating ourselves at the time, that there were any of a number of possibilities uh, that might have been available. Um, you could do something very much like the, what the New Jersey plan uh, which was introduced in mid-June 1787 by William Patterson. I'll put up a slide of him in a few minutes. You do something like what the William, uh, William Patterson would have imagined, which, you know, let's just add some additional powers to those already possessed by the Continental Congress under the Articles of Confederation. Maybe we don't have to change the structure of government at all. Or maybe we can, you know, we can, if we add a few powers, maybe that will take care of uh, everything that really needs to be done. That's not a bad position. That's a position that says, actually, we shouldn't expect the American people to be willing to go too far. Uh, you know, we should cut them some slack. You know, they lived through a long and expensive war. They're trying to recover from the war. There was, you know, significant commercial depression in the mid-1780s. So maybe we should, you know, cut the American people some slack and not expect too much from them. Uh, on the other hand, if you're a rabid nationalist, you could say, geez, why don't we just start over? Let's get rid of the states. Why do we need Rhode Island? You know, or Delaware. I mean, those states were always mistakes to begin with kind of little accidental communities or just kind of, you know, kind of became states, you know, really for no good reason, as far as I can tell. Um, but, you know, maybe also we have states of very different sizes. Maybe we should think about the optimal size of a state. You know, try, instead of having large and small states, maybe we should try to equalize the states. So that'd be a radical national, or maybe get rid of the states altogether. Hamilton, you know, might, might not have minded doing that. Um, and actually, do I have, no, I don't have Hamilton. Uh, we'll get to Hamilton momentarily, too. Uh, and then in between, there's the strategy that Madison works out, which I think was quite broad. I mean, A, it does say we really need a government in the full sense of the term. Uh, it's, you know, and so we, we, we should think, we should rethink uh, all the essential characteristics of Republican government, you know, maybe based a little bit on reading in the sources. You know, we should know our Montesquieu. We should know our Locke. We should at least know about Hobbes and Mont Machiavelli so we won't go wrong in some respects. But I think more important is the Americans have a, de have a decade of experience behind them uh, as thinkers and doers and actors together. And that's the experience they can draw on uh, in terms of trying to come up with some, you know, some, some strategy of reform. Um, so, and of course, Madison's, you know, what follows also from his analysis of the, the sources of fashion within the states, the, the, you know, the, his whole, you know, I won't say skepticism, but his airing of doubts about the wisdom of majority rule per se is Madison's idea that maybe the most important thing we can do is to give the national government some authority to intervene within the states individually, not just to strengthen the national government against the states or to make the national government independent of the states, but actually to give the national government, to give Congress, uh, what he calls a negative, we would say a veto, but what he calls a negative on all state laws. So if it had that negative, it could use it to protect itself against the interference from the states. We'll look at this in a couple, uh, in a couple of weeks when we talk about McCulloch versus Maryland, the great bank case of 1819. But maybe we could also use that power to intervene within the states to protect minorities within the states against the unjust legislation being passed by majorities. This is a really expansive agenda. It opens up about as many topics as you can imagine anyone could have discussed uh, 
at the time. I mean, short of abolishing the states, which of course would be a political non-starter, so not worth talking about, even though I think it might not have been a bad idea, you know, short of abolishing the states. It's hard to imagine a more expansive agenda. So that's why I think it really makes a lot of sense for us to think about Madison as a key figure, regardless of what his batting average was on particular items. Just you have to watch out for Lily's <laughs> thing there. So you're not going to hold it the whole time. <laughs> no, no, put it back down. It's just, anyhow. Um, okay. And then, so finally, the last point under, under the agenda is uh, to, um, the other thing I want to say, and it comes out of that letter to George Washington of April 16th that you also read for today. Uh, Madison also says, um, the first thing we have to do is to solve the problem of representation. Solving the problem of representation means Madison was firmly committed to majoritarian principles in both houses of Congress. If you're ever going to have a national legislature capable of acting on directly upon the American people and not just through the states, it has to be bicameral. You have to have two houses. Madison insists that some, some rule of proportionality uh, has to apply to both houses as opposed to allowing each state to have an equal vote. So Madison says, we have to decide this first before we decide which powers the national government will exercise. Other delegates don't agree. John Dickinson of Delaware, who had been the principal drafter of the Articles of Confederation a decade earlier, says, no, why don't we do it the other way? Why don't we start by figuring out what powers we want to give the national government? If they're not that expansive, maybe we don't have to alter the structure, but we don't have to alter the rule of voting. Madison has a different position. He says, we can't really agree on what powers we're going to give until, until we determine whether or not principles of justice in terms of the allocation of representation. Uh, will be respected or not. And that's what drives, really, the first six to seven weeks of the convention. That's, that's why when you get into the debates at Philadelphia, which we know best, of course, from Madison's notes, what we see is that one issue, how will seats in Congress be apportioned uh, among the states in both houses, is really the one dominant issue until you get to mid-July 1787 and the so-called Great Compromise. And talking about the so-called Great Compromise the, thus gets me to the three myths about uh, the Constitution, which are the real subject uh, of today's lecture. Um, so here, you know, here are three questions uh, that we're going to uh, consider. I think this is you know, fairly familiar stuff. In effect, by the way, each, you know, we deal in effect here with Article I, Article II, Article III. We deal with the article relating to Congress, the article relating to the executive, the article relating to the judiciary. If we had more time, we could talk about there are other things we could talk about under the federalism category in Article 4 and you know, Article 5 amendments and so on. But I think these are the, th the three myths, which I think are the three presuppositions, which are kind of most common in how we think about what happened in Philadelphia. Uh, and so, you know, let's just start by kind of outlining them, and then I'll go back and try to talk about each of them individually. Um, and by the way, if you guys have questions, it's fine. I mean, you can tell I've been full four beer and ready to go. But, you know, if, I, if I'm moving too fast, you want to interrupt me or stop me or even challenge my opposition to giving Wyoming two senators. I actually had a chance to say to Senator Barroso, I actually had dinner with him uh, a few months ago. I've, al I've always said, why does Wyoming have two senators? I've never heard a good explanation of this. I actually said it to him. The guy's completely, it's just a very serious guy. He didn't pick up on the question. Uh, anyhow. So the first one, I think, is the most familiar one. Um, you know, uh, so I think here's the common supposition we have. Giving each state an equal vote in the Senate was a true compromise, compromise in the best sense of the term, was a true compromise over representation, while the three-fifths clause over slavery was a moral failure, and I suppose I could have added, you know, and it was kind of politically unnecessary. Um, so the position I'm going to argue is I'm very much against uh, giving each state an equal vote in the Senate. I'm kind of with Madison on this, which is, again, go back to my prior slide, you know, maybe not so bad a position to be. Uh, and I'll try to explain why as we go along. Now, if I say I like the three-fifths clause, I want to make clear from the beginning, I'm not defending slavery. Uh, I'm not arguing that African Americans are 0.6 of Caucasians or others. In fact, that's not actually what the three-fifths clause does. Um, what I am saying is that there, it seems to me, that there are very real, there are very significant, is a very significant basis for understanding that there a much deeper compromise was, a, a deeper in the sense of longer lasting compromise was meant to be incorporated in the three-fifths clause than was true in the case of the equal state vote. And I'll explain why as we go along. Again, I'm not defending slavery, you know, lest there be any misunderstanding here. But I think in political terms, the case for the three-fifths clause is in some ways much better than the case for the equal state vote. And I want to try to explain why I think that. 
Um, the second position, that's fairly straightforward. Uh, there's a common supposition that why do we have the Electoral College? It's because the framers feared democracy. They were, you know, very skeptical and nervous about allowing the people to vote uh, for the president. I think that's wrong, and I'll try to explain you know, how I think we got stuck um, with the strange device of the Electoral College, which as soon as it goes into operation in a significant way in 1796, was already obsolete under, you know, under some suppositions. The first time it really makes a difference, you realize it's never going to act in any way resembling what people thought it, you know, it, it might do if you think it was really designed to get a better class of a uh, select group of electors to, to choose the president. And the third thing is a point that should be familiar to anybody who's thinking about going to law school. Uh, the f judicial review of legislation, the idea that courts should apply constitutional standards to legislation in order to determine whether or not acts of legislation are constitutionally permissible or not. Uh, it, you know, so there is a common supposition that that really was not part of the framers' design, or it was only a vague part, if a part at all, the framers' design, but really came into being uh, out of John Marshall's great opinion in the famous case of uh, McCullough versus, uh, not McCullough, Barbary versus Madison from 1803. Um, I think that's bunk. I think Marbury is a really interesting case, but not a significant one. It figures prominently in legal education, but that's for reasons other than the ones that historians or I think political scientists ought to respect. You know, Marbury is a case that's worth studying, but was it consequential? I don't think so. I think the origins of judicial review lie elsewhere, and I'll try to give a short account uh, of how that was the case. So those are the three myths uh, we're going to talk about today. Let's just bring a few characters online so you know who they are. So this is Alexander Hamilton. Uh, you know, along with Madison, you really, along with Madison and Jefferson, you know, the, the three, uh, and Franklin, you know, the, and maybe John Adams, so Adams, I think, was a bit of a street hitter. Uh, you know, kind of, you know, the five most powerful minds of this remarkable generation. Uh, Hamilton, of course, is famous at the convention for giving uh, his speech of June 18th, which is, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's a famous speech because it's, it's so, it's so partial and favorable to the British Constitution. And, kind of astonishes everyone, and, you know, has very little impact. Hamilton, in fact, was not all that active a delegate to Philadelphia. A much more important in one sense is, you know, the, as the original author and Madison's co-author in writing The Federalist. Uh, because uh, the, the two of the New York delegates left pretty early. Yates and Lansing leave the convention pretty early, go back to New York, and you guys are all going to become experts on New York uh, over the weekend. Um, and Hamilton, it kind of goes back and forth, mostly back to New York during the convention, though he does come back at the end. He goes back to his law practice, goes back to his family. Uh, but a major, major thinker, in my view, you know, maybe less a constitutionalist, but America's great state builder in the late 18th century. And when he's there, he makes an impact. Uh, Mass, of course, went to um, the College of New Jersey, now known as Princeton. And here are two other Princeton guys. On the left is Luther Martin, not Martin Luther, unless, you know, in case there's an ID on the exam, you want to, you know, get the names in the right order. Um, and William Patterson. Patterson, you know, Mar Martin's from Maryland. Martin will be the attorney for Maryland in the great case of McCulloch uh, 30 years later. He gives a famous two-day speech on protecting states' rights, uh, which many of us think was, and Madison conveys the impression, was probably delivered under the influence of spiritus fermenti, which Habibir can translate as as alcohol. <laughs> I mean, just you can tell from the way in which Madison des you know, describes how Martin was speaking. The, he may have you know, gone out a bit of a bender in order to get ready uh, to talk. You know, but he's a, he's a very serious states rights guy. Patterson is a much more interesting guy. Patterson is, I think, the son of Scots Irish immigrants. He's had a very small law practice before the revolution, and then the revolution gives him lots of opportunity. Becomes New Jersey Attorney General, serves on the first Supreme Court, uh, and was the principal author of the New Jersey plan. And then I put a couple of New Englanders up here. Uh, the guy on the left, Elbridge Gary, one of the three guys left at the end of the convention who would not sign. A very wealthy merchant from Marblehead, Massachusetts, which is up on the North Shore, you know, which, is, which is above Boston. Uh, and then to the right, Roger Sherman, who also figures prominently in the case for the equal state vote. Sherman was yeah, actually a, a merchant who had married well. He can't quite make it out here, but he, he had, Sherman, had a, Sherman had a kind of awkwardness to him. You see how he's sitting in this chair. He can't relax for the, you know, for the portraits. He's kind of... He's still kind of sitting there in a kind of half, you know, half-wired way, just can't quite unwind uh, to allow his portrait to be painted. But, you know, Sherman and William Samuel Johnson, his, his colleague, play a very active role in terms of supporting the equal state vote. Okay, so just, to, you know, there are other delegates I could show, but uh, that's enough.
Um, let me get a point up here that we'll talk about later, but not first. So let's go back. I want to talk now about the two compromises. So this is on the outline. Representation was a great compromise. You know, what we mean essentially the decision to give the states an equal state vote in the Senate. Was that a great compromise to be admired or not? Uh, the other side of the compromise is, of course, the three-fifths clause and under which seats in the House of Representatives and the allocation of direct taxes would be allocated among the states on the basis of population with slaves counter, counting as 0.6 of free persons. Slaves, of course, are not identified as slaves, are identified as other persons, but everybody knows what's meant uh, by that phrase. Okay? If you go back to that letter from uh, Madison to Washington, April, the April 16, 1787 letter, Madison discusses his political strategy for dealing with the representation question. And it's really, in another sense, it does, it does identify a kind of game theoretic aspect of his thinking. Namely, Madison, Madison says, here's how he thinks or hopes the politics of this issue will play out. He thinks the northern states will favor the idea of proportional representation in both houses uh, because they have, they, they have the population advantage now. Um, so it's in their current interest. But he also imagines, as other people did in the 1780s, this turns out to be a big mistake, but Madison is not unique in imagining this. He also imagines that the arc of population movement in the decades after the Revolution is going to work to the advantage of the South. The South will come more into parity with the North in terms of population. And therefore, that the South will, if it's calculating correctly, and Madison will try to help it to do so, uh, delegates from the South will, will recognize that in the long run, uh, this kind of formula will protect, will serve their interest. That's not a bad argument. Other Southern delegates shared it. In fact, if you, if you try to explain why is it that we have a census every 10 years, it's the Southern delegates led by Emmett Randolph who insists we really need to have a census to be taken rather than involving Congress to determine under its own discretion how seats will be apportioned in the House of Representatives. Uh, the Southern delegates, in this case led by Governor Edmund Randolph, who, who was very close to Madison, and what Mass addresses, uh, in the correspondence, Mass addresses Randolph as my dear friend, uh, whereas uh, when he writes Jefferson, it's only dear sir. It's an interesting, very kind of, you know, he's much closer to Jefferson over the long run. Interesting nuance uh, in, you know, in, uh, uh, in that. So uh, if you think you're the minority region, but it's going to work for you in the long run, you want to make sure a rule of representation and an explicit provision to have that rule honored, you know, as population shifts over time will be provided for in the Constitution, rather than leaving the discretion of Congress to use or potentially abuse in the interest of existing majorities. Uh, you may want to have a rule locked into the Constitution to protect your interest over the longer. So Madison says, look, here's a, here's a basis for imagining why proportionality should appeal uh, on a regional basis. But what do you do about the small states? Madison assumes they're just small states. You know, where are they going to go? What's Delaware going to do? You know, what's Rhode Island? the home of Jews, Turks, and infidels, as it's often known, because of its policy of religious toleration. What's Rhode Island going to do? In the end, the small states are going to have to fold. They're, they, they don't have many people. They're going to be part of the union. They're just not going to have the staying power to resist us. So that's Madison's calculation. He thinks he can argue them into you know, giving up on the point. And you know, I don't think it's a bad argument. And what's the basis of the argument? The basis of the argument, I think, is what kind of comes out in, in the little passage I, I have up here. Um, Again, if we went back to the vices of the political system, that last item, uh, or if, we, if you guys remember the basic argument of Federalist 10, you know, Madison is famous for arguing, what is, the ba what is the real basis of political affiliation or political orientation in our society? We want to identify what are the real interests, opinions, and passions that swirl through the body politic. What is it that makes us act politically, whether we're voters or whether we're officials? Uh, and the basic argument is, you know, we have to identify what are our real interests, opinions, and passions. We, you, know, what, you, know, is it, you know, do we identify ourselves on the basis of, you know, it might be, we might say, a, a kind of ethno-cultural identity. Could be occupation. It could be residence. The kind of community, and I want to stress community, not the kind of state, but the kind of community in which you live. It could be, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of political aff affiliations follow what we call ethno-cultural religious lines. You know, Jews and African Americans vote highly Democratic, um, you know, old, old line was still tend to be Republican, uh, and so on and so on. When Madison does want to argue, and I think he's correct on this, 
uh, and that's, I think, a big basis of his argument, is that the size of a state in which you live is politically irrelevant, <coughs> except under one condition. Ordinarily, on every occasion, the size of the state in which you live will have no effect at all. Nish nish, to quote Borat. It will have no effect at all on your political behavior. You will never ask the question, you know, how should the small states vote? How should the large states vote? Except, under, except there's one exception. What's the obvious exception? Taxes. No. Uh, well, okay, yeah, that, that will get factored in. But yeah, I mean, you're, you're getting to the conclusion before you've kind of formulated the problem. No, it's not about the Electoral College. But, but you're actually close. You are close. It's when you, ah. Uh, no, that's, that's going to be the opposition. That has nothing to do with the size of the state. Look, the, the quite, look if you, you know, if you're, let me take a step back. If you're having an argument about whether or not small states deserve to be overrepresented just because they're small, Madison's argument would be, Small states do not deserve representation, per se, because size is not correlated in any way with their interests. You're just going to give them an extra benefit because they feel nervous or they're, you know, they're uneasy. They think they're going to lose something. The exception is when you're voting on rules of voting and you're not operating behind John Rawls' veil of ignorance, right, where you don't know what your social position will be later. So if you're voting on rules of voting and you know what your interests are, of course you have an obvious incentive to favor large states or small states. And of course, the fact that Madison comes from Virginia can't be dismissed from this equation either, except he's right, and Luther Martin was looped, <laughs> or ultimately, you know, was wrong. So that's the key argument here. Size does not affect our, size does not affect our opinions. You know, here's an example. If you vote, suppose you're a big Second Amendment guy. Let's think about this, this, poor, this poor, really idiotic woman in Idaho. You know, taking her gun into a Walmart so she could be killed by a two-year-old. I mean, you know, most of the many tragic stories that swirl through our news these days, this is one of the most absurd. Uh, but let's say you're a strong Second Amendment person. You really believe in, you know, in Hunter's rights. It doesn't matter whether you live in what's sometimes called the Venison Belt from Western Pennsylvania to Michigan, let's say kind of working class guys who like to go out with their rifles on the weekend to plug away a deer, or whether you live in Idaho or Wyoming. You really believe that gun rights are the sacred right that, to which you're most attached, you know, if you're you know, like Charlton Heston or Wayne LaPierre or whatever. Does it really matter the size of the state in which you live? No, that's your issue. If you're an African American, does it matter whether you live in Alabama or Illinois? Probably not. Issues of racial justice will, yeah, they may present themselves somewhat differently. And so on and so on. So those are the real interests, opinions, and passions that Madison would strive on Federalist 10. Madison does, you know, if you try to think about a question, okay, when does living you know, I mean, size might sometimes be a variable for something else, but size, size doesn't predict, you know, being a rural thing. Rhode Island is a small state, and it's highly industrialized, highly urbanized, you know, and so on and so on. So, but it's, so, so, that, so that, that's the essential argument. Now, let's bring the slavery question uh, into mind here. So, okay, so Madison's position would be that of his allies, like Rufus King and, uh, you know, Hamilton and others. Um, would be the, let me close the door here. But I'll, I'll, stay, I'll stay inside. Ooh, sorry. Um, so, so Madison's concern is, you know, what you really want to do is you really want to identify what are the real interests that the country has to work on. The question of small states and large states, that's ephemeral. It's an interest at the convention because you have small state delegates there. And, you know, you have to listen to their arguments. You know, and some are lucid when William Patterson or Sherman or Johnson gets up, they're lucid, or Dickinson. Martin kind of drives people nuts because he's so repetitive. Uh, you know, you have to take the argument seriously. In the end, you don't find they're very convincing or persuasive because you know correctly that size is not a predictor of political behavior. Size will not be an issue henceforth. What will be an issue is slavery. And that's what this quotation, so this, this, this is a quotation I love, actually, Kind of missed the little bottom of the screen here. Let me just pull this down a bit, if I can. Um, so this takes place. Madison gives a speech on June 30th. It's just it's just at the point where the convention is about to deadlock on the question of representation. Said it finds itself more or less equally divided. Um, and Madison Madison's trying to break, break the deadlock. And this you know this kind of summarizes his position. If we want, you know, Madison concedes that you know it is important to 
uh, you know, where, where identifiable interests are there, we, you know, identifiable sense of being lasting, we want to know what they are, and, you know, they are entitled to some security. Why would you enter a constitutional compact if you thought your, your essential interests were not being secured? Basically, but we have to identify what are the real interests that deserve recognition. Uh, so, but, but he contended, this is Madison speaking for himself. By the way, um, I have a colleague at uh, Boston College, uh, Mary Builder, who's a JD historian type, who has a book coming out next year called Madison's Hand, which is very interesting. It's essentially it's a biography of Madison's notes of debate, which really forces us, more than anybody has ever done in the past, is going to force us to ask the question exactly, exactly how and when did Madison write his notes and how and when did he revise them. And she has an argument, not all of which I agree with, but it's interesting about the way in which Madison's views may have shifted a bit over time and the notes may have altered in response to that. You know, we, you can read it when it comes out. It should be out sometime this year. Um, so we can't say, you know, like any other text, we can't simply assume this is sacred scripture. You know, it's, it, it has to be critically examined as all historical texts have to be. But let's take it as it is because I think it still expresses the genius of Madison's thought. But he contended the states were divided into different interests, not by their difference of size, that's my emphasis, not by their difference of size, but by other circumstances. The most material of which resulted partly from climate. That's a very Montesquieuian notion. That deal, and since we're all here as Californians, without the polar vortex, you know, we can appreciate, you know, the significance of this statement. The idea here that you know climate is a major determinant of different forms of human behavior. It's the classic north-south argument you find in many cultures. Uh, the most part resulted partly from climate, but principally from the effects of their having or not having slaves. These two causes concurred in forming the great division of interest in the United States. It did not lie between the large and small states. It lay between the northern and southern. What Madison was doing at this point was a delicate operation. He's trying to introduce the slavery question, which is an awkward question to introduce, precisely for this reason, because it does identify a fundamental difference of interest. But he wants to introduce it in order to come up with a convincing argument as to why the small states have no valid claim uh, for equal, an equal state vote in either House of Congress over the long run. He says, this, this is the, and we'll see this, by the way, in coming weeks, since we're going to talk about the Civil War and Reconstruction. Madison is 100% accurate here. This is an interest that, um, you know, this was the lasting interest, certainly down to the Civil War and Reconstruction. Arguably, if you look at the state of American politics today, and you link the politics of race to the politics of slavery, uh, Madison sociology is much better than one says, no, the real conflict of interest is between large and small states. Okay, so he's trying. He's trying to, you know, he's trying, in a sense, he's, he is trying to argue. He's trying to convince uh, the other delegates of why he's right on the merits. Uh, and so, how does this, how does this story play out? Well, a few days, you know, the convention deadlocks on the equals on the representation of the Senate. A couple of days later, there's a compromise committee that meets. Madison's very much against having a committee meet. There's nothing you can do in committee. You can't do in the larger session. Convention's not that big anyhow. Uh, convention com com committee comes back with a proposal on July 5th. They take a day off to celebrate the 4th, which was becoming a holiday at that point. Um, and then at that point, the convention does agree. You know, in a matter of a few days, kind of I think July 7th and 9th, they kind of work their way through the, uh, you know, the three-fifths clause. I mean, essentially the outcome of this is that, you know, to accept the three-fifths clause for the House of Representatives. And that's, you know, you get, you get some very interesting debates here. I mean, people like Patterson say, uh, the real principle of representation is you're substituting for the larger population with political rights. Since slave never, slaves have no political rights at all, they should not be factored into the story of, uh, you know, in, into any kind of algorithm or just simple formula for representation. You know, they don't exist politically. Slaves are simply the objects of law. They're not subjective actors. Women and children, sense, are subjective actors. They do have rights of their own. Slaves have no rights. They are primarily property. Southerners say, well, no, but this, this is a, you know, a peculiar form of property, which is unusually important. That's somewhat euphemistic uh, in, you know, in, in many ways. But it's, it's, it's a sectional deal. And I think it's a good deal. Again, not because I like slavery, not because I'm trying to entrench the Constitution, but I think if you take, if you take the formula of Constitution making here, which is you have two, two regions, two or more regions with very different interests, and you want to put together a national union, this identifies a lasting interest that you have to compromise. It's ugly to us. It's a moral failure. We're not very happy with the framers for doing it. We wish they were more enlightened. 
But the fact is slavery is deeply embedded in the American social structure. And it's hard to imagine how a constitution that was framed as an anti-slavery document would have ever been ratified. So that's kind of, that's my first argument. And, and the upshot of this, by the way, let me just, you know, the story. So the convention deals with three-fifths clause, I think, pretty easily. You know, there's some more, there are some moral statements. They are interesting statements. They, they demonstrate what is actually a fairly new fact in American history, that slavery was becoming a moral issue. And which, it, you know, and most historians think slavery becomes a moral issue sometime around the middle of the 18th century. Not really been much of one before, but by the second half of the 18th century, it does become a moral issue. You can see how those concerns are resonating uh, through American thinking in the debate on the convention. Wincy, you okay? Gonna make it? Yeah, okay. Um, you, know, you know, if you need first aid, let us know. <laughs> we'll take care of you. Um, so, uh, you know, so the slavery question in the end is dealt with pretty easily. What happens with the equal state vote is it actually passes by the narrowest of margins. It passes, it's, you know, it's not a card prize. It, it carries five to four. There are 10 states present. It carries five to four with one state, Massachusetts, divided. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so, you know, passes five to four, you know, with one state, Massachusetts, which of course is one of the three most populous states, divided. Massachusetts is divided because Elbridge Gary, who, you know, I put up earlier, the guy from, you know, up on the North Shore from Marblehead. Uh, Gary, I think, was the first genuine maverick in American history. So Gary and one of his psychics, they split the Massachusetts delegation. Then what happens over time, you see what the electoral college is, Ex post, retrospectively, we start calling that decision a compromise. But that's meant more to justify it to the public than to describe what actually happened. Madison, one side won, the other side lost. And that's why Wyoming, for better or for worse, and Idaho have two senators, and those of us that live in 35, you know, California with its 37 or 40 million people, I remember we have now, we have two too. It's like the famous line in Ars Ar 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 a movie you guys probably don't know. The old lady, you know this one? The old ladies are just as good as you. They got 12 and you got 12. My favorite movie as a kid. Anyhow, yes, Cary Grant, uh, whose daughter actually once took you know, my lecture class here. It actually babysat for us a long time ago. <laughs> Anyhow, so that's, that's myth number one. I like, you know, I like the three-fifths clause, not because I like slavery, but in terms of what, what it says about the politics of constitution making. Secondly, the problem of presidential selection. Let's get the big guy up here. You could tell from when I put, you know, I stood next to Madison, and I, you know, both of us would play the one or the two if we went, if we were on the court. Washington, you could post up. You know, he's probably more mobile and dynastic as any. I don't know, know how much of a leaper he is, but in any case, Washington's the big guy, six three, six four. He would tower over ninety eight percent of his soldiers, many of whom were five foot four, were more Madison size. Uh, so there's a standing story about the presidency that was created in Washington's image. That's not true. Uh, is not true at all. Um, the framers went round and round on the presidency. Uh, and they make the critical decisions only with about, you know, in the last week and a half before the convention was to adjourn. They did so under conditions of profound uncertainty. Uh, and let me try to explain why that was the case. I'll try to do this in seven minutes and say five minutes for the judiciary. And then we'll wrap it up. So, for starters, I think the first thing to realize is that this was the one area of power where they really had to improvise or be creative the most. And why, as I say in the outline, there is no adequate model or precedent for a national Republican executive. The whole idea of executive power in the 18th century is still very much wrapped up either in the idea of monarchical government, which the Americans have clearly rejected, or of ministerial government, the kind that flourishes in Great Britain, which Americans had also renounced because a big part of their political convictions going into the decision for independence back in 1776 was that the British Constitution was being corrupted by a ministry that was really kind of a power-seeking clique uh, of, ag of aggressive office holders. So there's no real precedent for what a national Republican executive would look like. You, know, you, really, you really did have to make it up. You really had to think creatively about how you constitute this office. The dominant image is monarchy. That's not gonna work very well in a Republican society. Now the framers did reach two decisions pretty quickly which indicated how they were starting to react, however, against the Republican enthusiasms of 1776. They agreed within the first week of debate 
Um, they agree that the executive power should be vested in a single person. It won't be a collective executive. And as the first sentence of Article 2 says, and we'll talk a bit about this uh, down the road, the executive power shall be vested in the President of the United States. It's a significant statement. There, there was a plural executive in Pennsylvania. You know, you could have think of something more collective. But the idea that the executive official should be, you know, the executive power resides ultimately in a single figure who is the decision maker, that's a pretty significant step in and of itself. And secondly, the framers agree that the executive should have a limited negative veto over national laws that restores what we call prerogative. It's one of the key prerogative powers of the British Crown. It hadn't been used in Britain since 1707. The veto had disappeared. There was actually this young guy at Harvard named Eric Nelson who was just interested, uh, written a really interesting, although I think very problematic book on this whole subject, which argues there is a group of what he calls patriot royalists who actually like 17th century Stuart notions of monarchy. He has some good arguments. I, the ultimate argument I find deeply unconvincing, but you know, it's an interesting way to think about this. Okay. So they reach agreement on, on those key points pretty quickly, but then you have this whole puzzle. Again, there's no political precedent for knowing what is a Republican executive going to look like? So they get really hung up on the question of elections. And as I say here, if you look at the outline, there are three obvious modes of election that they could have picked. Uh, one is popular election. James Wilson from Pennsylvania, who also serves on the, you know, a Scots immigrant, who also serves on the first Supreme Court, and then di dies bankrupt of a heart attack in a uh, North Carolina jail in 1795 or so. Uh, came to a bad end. Uh, Wilson was a big advocate of popular election. Madison, though skeptical about it, comes around to Wilson's position. But having an election by the people has two problems. One is, if you have a genuinely popular election, which, by the way, I would do tomorrow if I were the lawgiver, get rid of the Electoral College, get rid of the states, just have one big constituency, let's call it the United States of America. Um, if you have that kind of election, think in regional terms, the South will be a big loser. Why? Because in the South, only citizens will vote. Slaves, slaves will have no recognition. So, you know, 40 to 60, depending on which county or state you look at, slaves are obviously a major part of the Southern population. We're also going to increase in time. They will have, they, you know, but if only citizens vote in one big constituency in the United States of America, the South is a net loser. So there's a big regional problem. It makes the Virginia dynasty kind of hard to imagine under those circumstances. The second problem, which is the better problem, and it goes back to the democracy point. It wasn't that the framers feared democracy. It wasn't the framers worried that American voters uh, would kind of, you know, follow passively or get kind of whipped in some kind of frenzy to follow the, you know, the next guy to come along on a white horse or a Palomino or whatever. Um, what they're really worried about was a kind of information problem. You know, it would be hard to identify truly national, what they say, truly national characters would have been their, you know, their, their kind of favorite word. I mean, it's easy with Washington. Washington's a no-brainer, assuming you can get him off Mount Vernon and agree to go back into the public sector. But after Washington, the prevailing assumption, it's a pretty good assumption, I think, this is not unrealistic, was that you'd have a lot of favorites on voting. The people would vote on a provincial or maybe a regional basis. It'd be very hard to get to a majority under those circumstances without having some kind of, you know, some kind of mode of on ongoing election. It was hard to figure out. So pro popular election looks pretty problematic. Not because the framers worried Americans, you know, would be swayed by, you know, proto-fascistic demagogues, you know, a Mussolini character or, or worse. Um, you know, it's hard to get worse, but you can do it if, you know, if you try. Um, it's not that they worried about that. It's that they really felt it would be real hard to, you know, it would be hard to imagine how popular elections would work. That turns out to be a terrible judgment, by the way. When you got to 1796 and 1800, Jefferson and Adams run against each other, other in effect. There's an obvious choice there. Framers not anticipate how electing a president would work as an incentive to create a party system. We'll talk more about this down the road. But it's not a bad expectation um, for 1788. Now, you can solve the information problem pretty easily. If you want to have an informed electorate, this is, some of this may sound a little counterintuitive, but it isn't. Um, just have legislative election. You know, we have Congress elect the president. The problem with that, though, I mean, at least that sounds informational. Who's going to be better informed than congressmen? And to us, this is becoming a little bit counterintuitive, but you have to give them some credit. You know, so, I mean, who's going to be more knowledgeable than members of Congress? You know, by definition, you know, they ought to be the most qualified guys. So you solve the information problem, but then you have another problem. And, and that problem, I think, is the decisive one. 
uh, which is that you know what you really want uh, is a uh, you know is a president who's going to be an independent executive. If you have um, if the president is going to be elected by Congress, he has to be a one-term president. You can't give him a second term because if you give him a second term, he's just going to toady up to the dominant majority in Congress. So he won't be independent. He'll be a tool, to use a popular term in the 18th century. And some people, here, here actually Hamilton is in some ways the most interesting example here. Some people understand, I think correctly, that ambition was, you know, was something you wanted, you know, the right kind of ambition was something you wanted to spur. If you put a president, you know, make him in charge of the whole government and give him political credit for what he does, that's going to encourage all the best motives for good governance. Anti-federalists don't agree because they worry a lot about tyrants and, and despots and the like. We'll talk about that next week and see, see how you guys want to argue about this uh, in your capacity as delegates. But I think that's the decisive, that was the decisive consideration. Was it the framers feared democracy? So we get stuck with the electoral college. So the, the argument here is that the two other modes of dissent, uh, excuse me, the two other modes of election, you know, the two obvious modes of election, popular election, which actually could have worked quite well from 1796 on, uh, or election by Congress, which could have worked well at any time, but carries with it. Both of them are subject to what appear to be killer objections. And the Electoral College is left as kind of the default mechanism. Uh, it has one obvious advantage. By the time it's adopted in the week of uh, September 4th to 8th, so it's the you know, convention adjourns on September 17th, so just you know, the you know, week and a half before the convention adjourns, uh, what, you know, what, you know, by that time, the framers have worked their way around the idea, Constitution is going to go to the people. We want to present this. As, it's in our interest to present this as a compromise. So that's why you see the structure of the Electoral College. The large states get the advantage in round one. If you can't produce a majority for electors in terms of, you know, how electors vote, they all have to vote on the same day. Then it goes, originally it's going to go to the Senate. But since the Senate was linked to the president, the appointments power and the treaty power, it takes the convention three days to figure this out, but then you allow the House to vote as if it were the Senate, voting by states. So you replicate the, the, you replicate the political compromises that went into the formula for constituting Congress. And you solve the separation of powers question because the president can run for re-election. And an incumbent president you know, will, will, will be in a somewhat different situation than a newcomer. Who were the electors going to be? Nobody had a clue. Nobody had any idea. You know, who they would be, how they would deliberate, what knowledge they would have. It's just, you know, it's, it's kind of an empty placeholder. George Mason says they might be men, uh, not even the second or even the third ability. I've actually met an elector or two, but if you ever meet an elector in your life, see, you know, see if it makes any difference in your political perceptions. So that's my second point. The third point I want to deal with quite quickly just has to do with Marbury. And I have about, we started a minute or two late, so guys, uh, 1048. So, Give me about three minutes, and we'll try to wrap this up pretty quickly. Um, but so here, here's a great place to start. The famous quotation from Alexander Bickel, uh, whose book, The Least Dangerous Branch, uh, is kind of one of, probably the, the greatest work of modern American constitutional theory, even though it's half a century old. Congress was created nearly full-blown by the Constitution itself. The vast possibilities of the presidency were, were relatively easy to perceive. I'm not so sure about that. Uh, and soon, inevitably materialized. That is correct. But the institution of judiciary needed to be summoned up out of the constitutional vapor, shaped and maintained, and the great Chief Justice, John Marshall, not single-handed, but first and foremost, was there to do it and did. If any social process can be said to have been done at a given time and by a given act, it is Marshall's achievement. The time was 1803. The act was the decision in the case of Marbury versus Madison. So that's the heroic law that's taught in the law school. So there are actually a lot of my buddies in con kind of law don't like to teach us anymore. I mean, I think they're, they're Marbury nihilists or Marbury skeptics uh, the way I am. Um, but again, let me try to briefly offer an alternative account here. Very, pretty simple account. It'll be Madisonian. Matt, one of Madison's key proposals, as I said the other day, in addition to the negative on state laws and proportional representation and so on, one of Madison's key proposals is the idea of following an example in the New York State Constitution and having a council of revision which would be a joint executive judicial council, which would possess a limited negative, a limited veto over legislation. Why did Madison like this idea? Because Madison, as I said previously, Madison was first and foremost a legislator. I mean, all his experience had been in, in, in activities of collective deliberation, whether in the Continental Congress or in the Virginia Assembly. 
And Madison, particularly by 1787, was deeply, deeply mistrustful of the quality of legislative deliberation. He's actively looking for ways to improve it and to enhance it. And so he, if he's skeptical about it, what he wants to do, he thinks the key thing will be to try to improve the quality of legislative deliberation ex ante. It's much better to have statutes that are better drafted at the beginning than to have to deal with poorly drafted statutes later on. It's much better, in other words, to improve the quality of lawmaking before a statute takes effect than to deal with its consequences later when it has to be litigated out to be, you know, to be, be to for its enforcement be made more sensible. So Madison sees a kind of trade-off here. Better to have advanced, you know, better have legislation like this ex ante than deal with the consequences ex post. But when he proposes the council revision, you see that all the other framers understand that it's, but you know, that or you know, most of the other framers, you know, except for James Wilson, think this is not a good idea. And their basic argument is that, you know, A, judges cannot act in political capacity. So it just, it will compromise the judicial role to involve judges in lawmaking when you're making policy decisions. You just won't be able to draw a line very sharply between technical legal advice on the one hand and policy decisions on the other. And secondly, the proper time for judges to determine constitutionality is when you have actual, what we now call actual cases and controversies. Instead of imagining something before it takes place, the you know, better outcome is to let a real controversy evolve and then work it out then. So on that basis, the idea that Marbury versus Madison, which nobody cites as a precedent for a long time afterwards, is the source of judicial review, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, the idea was clearly there. It's a new idea, and the framers were aware it was a new idea. There's one last wrinkle, and then we'll call it a wrap. But the real application of judicial review as, the fra as I think the framers saw about Madison as well, would not be against Congress, it would be against the states. And that's, which is, by the way, what the supremacy clause of the Constitution does. Uh, the real application of judicial review would not be against uh, the national legislation, it would really be against states. In the sense, judicial review, first and foremost, was, you know, was the alternative to Madison's idea of coercing the states into doing what they're supposed to do. It's to provide a legal remedy for efforts by the states to interfere or not comply or somehow try to muck up the enforcement of national legislation. So it's great as a federalism question. But the idea that it's doctrinally novel, that's, I think that's a big misconception. And we'll come back and talk about this in a couple of weeks because we will have a lecture on McCall versus Maryland uh, and Marbury versus Madison, kind of the, the, the two seminal cases. Uh, so thanks a lot. Um, you know, uh, Lily left all the stuff uh, we need for next week up here. Federalist, anti-federalist, moderates, and some other stuff. Uh, here's the outline for today if you want to have it. And Lily, Lily taped the lecture, and she'll, uh, uh, you know, she'll, uh, she'll, she'll make, she'll, she'll start working out her notes, so you guys will have it. Um, so we'll all be here, I hope, on Monday, and we'll just see how this experiment goes. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org. Thank you.